Riders on the storm Riders on the storm Into this house we're born Into this world we're thrown Like a dog without a bone And packed her out alone Riders on the storm You know the day destroys the night Night divides the day Try to run, try to hide Break on through to the other side Break on through to the other side Break on through to the other side Yeah We chased our pleasures here Dug our treasures there But can you still recall Time we cried Break on through to the other side Break on through to the other side
Astrology. Yeah, that's right. That's right, baby. I, I am a Sagittarius. The most philosophical of all the signs. But anyway, I don't believe in it. I think it's a bunch of bullshit myself. But I'll tell you this, man. i tell you this. I don't know what's going to happen, man. But I want to have my kicks before the whole shit house goes up in flames. All right. All right. Stars fall from the sky While you and 
You are invited to participate in a true multimedia experience coming to a home near you. LCM TV is bringing Lake County into the new millennium with news, live broadcast, information, music, talk shows, and local programming. All streaming in high definition online and soon to be on your Roku box. Join us at lcm-tv.com or be a part of our studio audience. You can also watch the shows at lakecomagazine.com as we provide programming to inform, enlighten, and maybe even enrage you. On Lake County Magazine Talk Show with Terry and Pete the Tax Guy, Wednesday mornings at 9 a.m. Like racing? Try the Checkered Flag Show, hosted by Ace Naylor, on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. All ages and divisions in regional and national fields. Joni Lane brings a positive light to you every Monday at 3 p.m. Pasha Space brings an international flair as they discuss ecological, health, and social issues in Haiti with people around the world. End up your week with positive, conscious sounds on Saturday at 9 a.m. with Sister T on the bridge. This show is also simulcast on KMEC 105.1 FM in Ukiah. Our latest show, LCM TV News, is brought to you live Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at noon and rebroadcast at 6.30 p.m. and noon daily, Tuesdays, Saturday, and Sunday, featuring national, regional, and local news, weather, and sports. We have it all here for you on your local TV station, LCM TV. Join us online and soon on Roku, giving you access to all the best Lake County has to offer. We are LCMTV.com, your multimedia connection. Tune in for the fun. It's live TV at its best. Hey, good afternoon. This is uh, LCM TV News at Noon, not your normal news. I'm Pete Schiffman. Hi, Megan Berger. And our first national story today. American intelligence agencies have extracted valuable information about the Islamic State's leadership structure, financial operations, and security measures by analyzing materials seized during a Delta Force commando raid last month that killed a leader of the terrorist group in eastern Syria, according to United States officials. The information harvested from the laptops, cell phones, and other materials recovered from the raid on May 16th has already helped the United States identify, locate, and carry out an airstrike against another Islamic State leader in eastern Syria on May 31st. American officials expressed confidence that influential Lieutenant Abu Hamid was killed in the attack, but the Islamic State, which remains resilient, has not yet confirmed the death. Resilient. I know. New insights yielded by the seizure trove, 47 terabytes of data, according to one official, include how the organization's shadowy leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, operates and tries to avoid being tracked by coalition forces. The materials also revealed new details about how the Islamic State has allocated revenue from oil production. About half goes to the group's general operating budget. The remainder is split roughly between maintaining the oil field production facilities and for salaries to the workers. According to a senior State Department official, from the raid we learned quite a bit that we did not know before. Every single day the picture becomes clearer of what this organization is, how sophisticated it is, and how global it is, and how networked it is. A video of a police officer pointing a gun at teenagers in bathing suits and shoving a young black girl's face in the ground has become the latest flashpoint in relations between the police and minorities. The video appears to show the officer, David Eric Casebolt, briefly waving his handgun at young partygoers who approached him as he tried to subdue the teenage girl on Friday. The officer immobilized the girl by putting her face down on the ground and placing a knee on her back. Chief Greg Conley of the McKinney, Texas Police Department said that the video had prompted an internal affairs investigation and that Officer Bolt, a patrol officer, had been placed on administrative leave. One adult man was arrested on charges of interfering with the duties of a police officer and evading arrest. The 14-year-old girl who had been immobilized by Officer Bolt was temporarily detained but ultimately released to her parents. The pool party took place in a neighborhood that is usually marked by friendly friendly relations amongst black, white, Hispanic, and Asian residents. Officers responded to a call about a disturbance involving multiple juveniles at the location who did not live in the area or have permission to be there, refusing to leave. 
They received several additional calls related to this incident advising that the juveniles were now actively fighting. On Sunday, a black teenager named Tatiana said her family was hosting a cookout for friends when a woman insulted them, saying, you need to go back where you're from, and saying to go back to your Section 8 home, prompting a 14-year-old family friend to respond. Tatiana replied, excuse me, and then another white woman hit her in the face and both women attacked her. The video of the police response shows Officer Caseball using profanity and shouting at teenagers as he and others Officers tried to round up some of them and shoo the others away. He appears to grab the girl in frustration when she does not leave the area. I was one of the only white people in the area when this was happening, he stated. Tatiana said, you can see in part of the video where he tells us to sit down and he kind of steps over me and tells all my African American friends to go sit down. The officer has quit his job. New Jersey's top court sided Tuesday with Governor Chris Christie in his fight against public worker unions over pensions, preserving major cuts meant to starve off a budget, excuse me folks, stave off a budget crisis, and giving the governor a win as he weighs a Republican presidential bid. In a 5-2 ruling, the state Supreme Court said there wasn't an enforceable contract to ensure full payments to workers, as unions had argued there was. The court overturned a lower court judge's order that told the Republican governor and the Democrat-controlled legislature to work out a way to increase pension contributions for the current fiscal year, which ends June 30th. While the court fight over pensions is likely over, unless unions find a way to appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court, pensions are still a major political and physical issue in New Jersey. June is shaping up as a time of reckoning for President Obama and his legacy. Over the next three weeks, he could record significant wins on three of his most ambitious initiatives or have each of them blow up in his face. And those outcomes are largely outside of the president's control. On Capitol Hill, lawmakers in the House are nearing a make or break vote on Obama's broad Pacific Rim free trade deal with 11 other countries. At the Supreme Court, the nine justices will soon rule on a crucial provision in the president's landmark 2010 health care law with the insurance plans of more than 6 million people in the balance. And in Geneva, U.S. and Iranian diplomats face a June 30th deadline to announce a deal on the future of Tehran's nuclear program. A string of victories would provide the administration political momentum heading into the final stretch of Obama's presidency as he begins to frame the story of his administration after years of fierce combat with Republicans. A string of losses would undermine the White House's message of transformational progress just as the 2016 campaign for his successor heats up and his presidency is examined in the crucible of an election season. The hurdles facing the administration are distinct and unpredictable, and inside the West Wing, Obama aides have compartmentalized their fight on each front. White House allies acknowledge that the president and his advisors are actually aware of the stakes, acutely aware of the stakes. Sorry. The health care law is considered Obama's signature domestic policy achievement. The trade accord is central to his economic agenda, and the Iran nuclear deal could reshape the security environment in the Middle East and stand as his defining foreign policy success. Until only a few weeks ago, one of the most devastating outbreaks egg farmers has ever seen in the United States has gone largely unnoticed. The industry, which had to kill off more than 20 million birds in May alone, was well aware, but consumers who had yet to feel the consequences were largely aloof. The bird flu, which first appeared in this country back in December, is now so widespread that it has caused egg prices to spike. The impact has been severe enough that one of the largest supermarket chains in the country, worried about the supply pinch, has begun rationing eggs. But the avian flu has become a vast economic affecting several regions of the county. As of today, there have been almost 47 million reported cases of bird flu, according to the estimates by the United States Department of Agriculture. Most of those have affected egg-laying hens. Part of the issue is that American farmers have never had to deal with the bird flu before, leaving them ill-prepared to stop it from spreading. Making things worse, scientists don't have a grasp on how it or why it has spread. The virus, which was first detected in Washington State, has spread throughout much of the United States. The price of eggs has more than doubled, both for eggs sold in liquid form and eggs solid in shells since April, when the virus began to spread like wildfire. 
Coming up next, folks, is the regional news, and we'll be right back. Yeah, I know. The tax man's taken all my dough And left me in my stately home Blazing on a sunny afternoon And I can't sail my yacht He's taken everything I got All I've got this sunny afternoon Manticorp Tax and Accounting can help you minimize taxation, establish a corporate presence, and save you money. Our over 25 years of experience in domestic and international taxation and incorporation services makes us the best at what we do. Your first consultation at Manticorp is always free, and our discounted rates guarantee you will not end up paying for what you don't get. Try Manticorp today. For more information, call 707-701-6416 or email info at manticorpusa.com. And we're back with the regional news. The Santa Rosa City Council rejected a hastily proposed moratorium on rent increases of more than 3% Tuesday, but embraced expanding services to help more homeless people get off the streets. The council unanimously agreed to boost support for the county's new homeless outreach services team, backing a plan endorsed by city staff to spend nearly $500,000 on new services in and around the city. These include a 24-7 hotline for people facing homelessness, stipends for people willing to help clear out encampments, and a rapid rehousing program that gives homeless people vouchers for a place to stay, such as hotel, motel, or a campground, while they explore other housing options. It's absolutely necessary that we do more, and this looks like it could be a significant step, Vice Mayor Chris Corsi said, stressing that more would be needed. Ben Segur Family Winery, founded more than 30 years ago by a pioneering Sonoma Valley wine family, who helped bring green farming practices into the mainstream, is being sold to one of the world's largest producers of low-priced wines. The wine group, the world's third largest wine company with such budget brands as Fanzia, Almaden, and Corbett Canyon, announced Monday it has purchased the winery in Glen Ellen and its nearby sister winery, Imagery. Financial terms were not disclosed, though industry estimates range from less than $90 million to slightly more than $100 million. It is the second blockbuster deal in two deca decades for the Bessinger family, which built its first wine brand, Glen Ellen, into the largest wine label in Sonoma County before selling it in 1993 to Hublin for an estimated $80 million. Mike Bessinger, founder and chief executive officer of his family winery, said the wine group will continue the green farming tradition that has been calling card of the winery he founded with his late father in 1980. The wine group, at first glance, doesn't appear to be a natural fit for Bessinger, which produces 139,000 cases of wine annually, according to the Gromberg Fredrickson Report, with prices that can go as high as $80 per bottle on its website. The wine group produces almost 60 million cases of wine a year, much of it sold in three and five liter boxes. The purse includes the Bessinger family winery and its 85-acre estate adjacent to Jack London State Park. The winery has become a significant tourist attraction in Sonoma Valley, taking visitors on tours throughout its vineyards on trams. The wine group will also acquire the family's imagery winery and its tasting room on Highway 20, two miles east of Bessinger. Governor Jerry Brown's administration is proposing a $15, or sorry, $15 million tax credit to Electric vehicle maker Tesla Motors after California lost out in a heated bidding war for the company's new battery plant. Did the Democratic governor's GoBiz agency on Monday announce 63 proposed tax credits totaling $49.5 million. The company's promise to create more than 11,000 jobs. The Tesla credit would offset taxes for the Fremont, California-based company to buy manufacturing research and development equipment buy property and hire 4,400 workers. California lost out last year in a heated bidding war for the company's $5 billion battery factory. Brown said then that he didn't think what Tesla sought would be fair to taxpayers. Nevada won after offering $1.3 billion in tax breaks. A state board will consider the tax credits June 18th. 
A 20-year-old pilot who made an emergency landing in a single-engine plane on Highway 101 in the South Bay said Monday that he had done his best to stay calm as he worked to save his life and those of his three friends on board. Wyatt Groh, 20, of San Jose, said he and his three buddies had enjoyed a steak dinner at Harris Ranch in Colinga, Fresno County, on Saturday evening. They then climbed into a 1978 Piper PA-28 Cherokee he had rented and took off from the adjacent airstrip. Groves have landed at Reed Hill, excuse me, Hillview Airport in San Jose, but his engine quit about 11 p.m. when he was several miles short of the runway. He radioed the airport tower and began concentrating at the task at hand. Groves realized that his best bet would be to land on southbound Highway 101. Some cars had to scoot out of the way as he touched down gently near Coyote Creek Golf Drive between San Jose and Morgan Hill, but no one was hurt. The cause of the engine failure is still under investigation. At least 65,000 homes and businesses lost power Monday in a heat-related outage across the Bay Area, including more than 50,000 customers in the East Bay and 12,000 in San Jose. The outages continued into the night, and by 9.30 p.m., work crews responded to a large outage in the East Bay affecting some 45,000 customers. The outage knocked out power at the downtown Berkeley station, which had to be shut down. The blackout culprit was reportedly a squirrel in an El, Centro's El Cerrito substation, according to Berkeley side. Power elsewhere in the Bay Area went down mostly due to temperature-related equipment failures. There were more than 20 separate outages reported Monday in Walnut Creek, Antioch, Pinole, Martinez, and Brentwood, affecting nearly 6,000 customers. Berkeley lost power and BART was forced to temporarily shut down the downtown Berkeley station. Trains continued running on the Richmond line. Some 16,000 customers lost power in Richmond and El Cerrito. The warm weather that baked much of the Bay Area took a toll on BART's equipment as well, as a transit agency reported major delays on the Daly City line in the midst of the evening commute due to problems with the track caused by the heat. We will be back with your local news. SSS Multimedia is sending you smoke signals, providing their clients with the ultimate communication and multimedia marketing, distribution, production, and web-based services. They feature high-def video equipment and quality audio sound. SSS is your multimedia source, from graphics for business cards to television production, radio, live sound, and everything in between. SSS is sending you smoke signals. Get your message out with SSS Multimedia. For more information, call 707-701-6416 or email info at sssmultimedia.com. And in local news today, a Mendocino County woman died after a rollover accident along Highway 20 in Nice on Tuesday morning. According to California Highway Patrol investigators, the victim lost control of her Toyota Corolla rounding a curve. The car careened across the highway and off the pavement. In a violent collision, the Toyota smacked into an embankment, causing it to roll. During the rollover, the car crashed into a tree where it came to a stop. Authorities are withholding the name of the deceased, a 65-year-old from Redwood Valley, pending notification of the family. The incident began at approximately 6.15 a.m. when she allegedly attempted an illegal pass. According to a CHP report submitted by Sergeant Brian Engel, the victim entered a two-way turn lane westbound, allegedly in an effort to get by a white pickup truck. The initial report suggests the other vehicle responded by picking up speed. However, the witness who was following behind lost sight of the two vehicles as they rounded the curve. The witness reportedly did not see the accident, instead coming across the aftermath. A call for emergency assistance went out almost immediately. Firefighters and medical personnel arrived, but pronounced the woman dead at the scene. She was still wearing her safety belt. CHP officers are uncertain whether the driver of the white pickup truck also witnessed the accident. The truck continued westbound after the crash, it is unknown at this point in the investigation whether alcohol or drugs played a role. Authorities are actively seeking witnesses or those with information that would help them to identify the driver of the pickup. 
they ask anyone with such information to call CHP at 707-279-0103. A case involving District 5 Supervisor Rob Brown may go to trial in July if a settlement is not reached. The case involves an alleged altercation that occurred between Brown and plaintiffs Robert and Jan Sanders in 2012 when Brown went to serve civil paperwork at a house located on Buckeye Street in Clear Lake. On August 21, 2012, Clear Lake Police responded to a report, a reported assault around 9 p.m. that followed Brown's attempt to serve. Multiple claims, including elder abuse, fraud, battery, assault, trespassing, and intentional emotional distress were filed as a result of the incident. However, during a case management conference on May 19, all but three of the original 14 claims were dismissed with a sustained demurrer without leave to amend. This means the charges cannot be changed in order to remain a part of the case, according to Stephen Brown, Rob Brown's attorney. Susan Feeney, who represents the Sanders, requested a continuance of motion to dismiss, but was denied. The claims were dismissed as a result of insufficient evidence. Assault and battery are the only remaining claims against Rob Brown. According to court documents, Rob Sanders sternly grabbed Brown by the arm and spun him around. That is when Brown reportedly punched him one time in self-defense. Despite statements in the court documents and the charges dropped for lack of evidence, the couple claims that Rob Brown was acting in a hostile and aggressive manner. Brown denies any intention of causing unlawful, harmful, or offensive touching or immediate harmful contact with Robert Sanders, according to the reports. A settlement conference is scheduled for 8.15 a.m. on June 23rd in Department 4. If a settlement is not reached, the case will go to trial on July 15th. Fire crews, aided by a drop in wind, took about four hours to extinguish a 25-acre wildland fire Friday evening along Highway 20 near Walker Ridge Road east of Clear Lake Oaks. The Oasis fire was reportedly sh was reported shortly before 8 p.m. The first fire crews on the scene reported a 10 to 15 acre fire heading north up hills covered in heavy brush and oak trees at a moderate rate of speed. No structures were threatened. The fire stayed low to the ground as it burned through grass and brush dried by the state's four year drought, but exploded when it reached oak trees with flames shooting 20 to 30 feet into the air. Firefighters from three agencies, Cal Fire, Williams Fire Department and North Shore Fire Protection District arrived on scene around 8.15 p.m. At its peak, more than 100 firefighters battled the blaze with 10 engine companies, two bulldozers, two water tenders, four 20-person hand crews, one water-dropping helicopter, and two air tankers, according to Cal Fire Battalion Chief at the scene. By 10 p.m., battalion chiefs from Cal Fire and WFD so the fire had consumed about 20 acres, but that fire crews had the blaze surrounded and did not expect it to spread much further. The fire was limited to 25 acres due to the lack of wind and a quick and aggressive response from fire agencies. Jury deliberations are underway to decide the verdict in a case against a niece man accused of murder. Daniel Ray Lloyd, 52, is charged with six felony counts including murder, attempted robbery and assault with a deadly weapon after allegedly shooting Cindy Yvette Quiet in the abdomen and causing her death in Lucerne nearly four years ago. She was 48 years old. He has acknowledged his shot led to her death, but has pleaded not guilty to his charges. Lord was reported, Lloyd was reportedly trying to rob a man who was with Quiet, Patrick Ryden, of cash and drugs at the time of the incident. He allegedly pointed a revolver at Ryden's face. Ryden smacked the gun away, causing it to fire and kill Quiet. Having started in April, the trial was expected to be finished by June 5th, but the deliberations will continue on June 12th. Lloyd's attorney, David Markham, requested the date because of medical appointments, as well as being retained for a felony case in Mendocino County. Since his arrest, Lloyd has been held at the Lake County Hill Road Correctional Facility with a bail set at $5 million. The family of a Lake County vineyard worker who was killed in a 2013 head-on crash with a sheriff's deputy has settled a wrongful death lawsuit for $600,000, their lawyer said Friday. Gabriela Rivas Garcia, 26 of Clear Lake, was killed on Highway 29 near Lower Lake when Deputy James Scott Lewis slammed into her Honda Civic with a Chevy Tahoe. He was rushing to the scene of a home invasion robbery. Lake County supervisors approved the settlement last week, said the family's lawyer, Jeremy Feetz, 
The family sought $10 million in a county claim but took less, in part because of the uncertainty of receiving a jury award. The county did not admit liability with the settlement. Lewis, who suffered major injuries, later was indicted on suspicion of gross vehicular manslaughter. Investigators said he attempted to pass another car on a shoulderless blind curve. He was not accused of being impaired by alcohol, as alleged in the family's lawsuit. Toxicology testing showed he had a blood alcohol level of 0.04%, which is half the legal limit. His trial was set for August. Four home invasion robbery suspects were charged in Garcia's death. The crash happened early in the morning on October 3, 2013, as Garcia was driving to work. The deputy crossed the center line on the winding stretch of highway, killing Garcia instantly. She left behind a fiancé and dependent family members. Since the discovery of a deadly tree disease in the south end of the county more than a decade ago, the area has been in quarantine. It's called sudden oak death, but it's not so sudden, and by the time the signs are visible, dead leaves, bleeding, and brown cankers on trunks, it's too late. Once you see the symptoms in the leaves, it appears to be happening quickly, Katie Harrell, University of California, Berkeley Public Information Officer said. But in reality, it takes at least six months to several years from the time the tree is infected for it to die. Lake County's confirmed case came in May 2004, making it the 13th California county to add to the quarantine area. Harrell is a member of the California Oak Mortality Task Force, a nonprofit group formed in 2000 for that is responsible for coordinating the coalition of state, local, and volunteer agencies in order to manage and minimize the spread of SOD. Although patches of dead trees are evident throughout Lake County, experts doubt the SOD is the cause. The disease occurs when the trees are exposed to Phytophthora ramorum, which is also the cold and inhibits, and inhibits the tree's ability to transport food and water. The relatively new pathogen was first discovered in 1995 when large numbers of tan oak trees were dying in the Marin and Santa Cruz counties, according to the task force research. The infestation has spread to 15 northern coastal counties in California, where it thrives in the cool, moist setting. Conditions are thought to spread the pathogen by dispersing spores from the leaves of foliar hosts, according to the task force website, through the wind-driven rain, water, plant material, or human activity. While many communities have cut fireworks displays from their budgets, the city of Lakeport has kept this tradition alive and well. Once again on Saturday, July 4th, a magnificent fireworks display will be produced by Pyro Spectaculars, who has contracted for the show for a couple of decades, first with the Lake County Chamber of Commerce and now with the city directly. The display is fired off barges purchased by the chamber several years ago, well into the lake to preclude causing accidental fires on shore. Over the years, the Chamber has conducted an Add a Dollar campaign to raise funds to help fund the fireworks. That campaign for 2015 has begun with Bruno Shop Smart in Lakeport. Additionally, donations can be dropped off the Chamber office at 875 Lakeport Boulevard at Vista Point. All donations collected by the Chamber are given to the city to help offset the cost of the display. For questions concerning the donations, please contact the Chambers at 707 263 5092. Coming up next is the weather. Please stay tuned. The tax man's taken all my dough and left me in my stately home, blazing on a sunny afternoon. And I can't sail my yacht. He's taken everything I got All I've got this sunny afternoon Manticorp Tax and Accounting can help you minimize taxation, establish a corporate presence, and save you money. Our over 25 years of experience in domestic and international taxation and incorporation services makes us the best at what we do. Your first consultation at Manticorp is always free, and our discounted rates guarantee you will not end up paying for what you don't get. Try Manticorp today. For more information, call 707-701-6416 or email info at manticorpusa.com. In a 
And we're back with the weather. Wednesday, the weather will be mostly cloudy with a 20% chance of rain shower with a high of 81. Winds are out of the southwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. In the evening, there will be partly cloudy skies with a low of 61. Winds south southeast at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Thursday will be mainly sunny with a high of 94. Winds from the southwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour. There is no chance of rain. In the evening, we will be back to clear skies with a low of 63. Winds from the south southeast at 10 to 15 miles per hour. On Friday, we will see sunny skies with the highs increasing to 101 degrees. Northerly winds shift from the west-southwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour. We're going back to 100 degree weather. And did you enjoy our lightning storms last night? Yeah, I'm also going to be back in Phoenix. Yeah. In sports today, Cole Bronaski, senior catcher of the Clear Lake High School varsity baseball team, is the most valuable player on the 2015 edition of the All-North Central League One baseball team, as recently selected by a vote of the league's coaches. It's the second straight year the Cardinals catch has earned MVP honors. After a 13-1 run through the league in 2014, Clear Lake went 14-0 this season and the strong play of Bronaski behind the plate as well as his red-hot bat is a big reason why. Among Lake County hitters, Bronaski led his peers in 40 hits, 4 home runs and 34 RBIs. Clear Lake won his first 26 games this season, including all 14 league contests, before falling to Head Royce, he, Head Royce excuse me, of Oakland 7-3 in the semifinal round of the North Coast Section Divisional 5 playoffs. Joining Bronaski on the All-League First Team are teammates Dylan Williams, a senior pitcher infielder, Jared Strait, a senior infielder, Jack Egger, a senior infielder. Williams and Strait are both making their second straight appearance on the team. Other Lake County First Team selections are Middletown senior pitcher infielder Tyler Holt and Kelseyville junior pitcher infielder Noah Lindell. Five Lake County players received second team honors, including senior pitcher Jordan Chena of Clear Lake, who was undefeated on the season at 10-0. Also honored were Clear Lake junior Brendan Coakley, Clear Lake senior Matt Heller, Middletown senior Cody Chorgel, and Kelseyville sophomore Logan Barrick. It's Heller's second straight appearance on the All-League team. Clear Lake High School beat the St. Joseph Notre Dame Pilots 5-1 to win the Division V championship game. Aliza Atkins' three-run blast, her only hit of the 2015 North Coast section playoffs, proved to be the decisive blow as the Cardinals played Powerball. Atkins' 3-1 line drive, a shot down the left field line, carried over the fence with two outs in the bottom of the third inning to give the Cardinals a 4-0 lead. Until then, it looked like winning pitcher Rachel Wingler's one-out home run in the bottom of the second, a ball struck deep over the fence in the left center field, might be enough to win it, given the way Wingler was pitching. The junior retired 10 straight after surrendering the solid single to Sarah Mailer to open up the game. Wingler didn't run into any trouble until the top of the fifth. When the Pilots put runners at second and third on the strength of back-to-back one-out singles by Dahlia Caseda and Grace Oransky. A stolen base put runners at second and third before Wingler struck out Leah Akima and got Mahler to pop out to third base to end the inning. Clear Lake opened the season 4-5 but won 16 of its final 17 to push 20, to finish at 26. Along with the section championship pennant they'll now hang from the gym's rafter, the Cardinals also secured a league pennant as North Central League ICO champs along with Cloverdale. On Monday, the Major League Baseball draft was held. With the 18th pick, the Giants took shortstop Phil Bickford, a right-hander from College of Southern Nevada, the same junior college that Bryce Harper used as a launching pad for his Major League Big League career. The Giants also had the 31st pick as compensation for losing Pablo Sandoval to free agency and chose Boston College first baseman Chris Shaw, considered by MLB.com's draft analysis, as the best power hitter in this year's class. Oakland also had two first-round picks, selecting Richie Martin, a junior at Florida, who is hitting 292 with a 404 on-base percentage this season for the Gators, who play Miami on Saturday at the College World Series in Omaha, Nebraska. Alabama's Mickey White was selected with a second pick. White started at shortstop in each of Alabama's 184 games since his arrival there three seasons ago and hit 339 with a 444 on-base percentage in 2015. 
The United States appeared nervous Monday when it opened the Women's World Cup. Hope Solo settled an unnerved team with three gymnastics saves on the first half, and Megan Rapinoe delivered two goals with her creativity and daring. In the end, the Americans prevailed 3-1 over Australia, the victory being more important than elegant. Solo, who has troubles off the field, remained impervious on the field Monday, and it seems unlikely that the United States could win the World Cup without her. Rapinoe, too, appears indispensable in midfield as the team's most inventive player. With the Americans not fully confident or steady, she scored the match's first goal in a deflected blast in the 12th minute and delivered another with a long, dazzling run into the 78th minute. The United States will play Sweden here Friday, a co-favorite in the group. Sweden got off to its usual slow start in the World Cup, leading by two goals at halftime, before hanging off for a 3-3 tie against Nigeria's expert passing, one-on-one -on -one skill and speed. The Yanks got lucky. The Aussies were much better. Hmm. But then I'm prejudiced. Pushed by a crowd howling to see Cleveland's 51-year title drought in, LeBron James scored 40 points. His new sidekick, Matthew Della Vadova, added 20, and the Cavaliers survived Golden State's furious fourth-quarter comeback led by Stephon Curry for a 96-91 win over the Warriors on Tuesday night to take a 2-1 lead in the NBA Finals. James added 12 rebounds and 8 assists in 46 minutes, his third stellar performance in the fifth straight finals. The Cavs, who won Game 2 at Golden State for their first ever finals win, now have the first at Quicken Loans Arena. The Cavs led 92-83 with 51 seconds to go, but got careless with the ball and Curry heated up. The league's MVP finally found a shooting touch in the fourth quarter, Scoring 17 points, the Warriors, who trailed by 20 in the third quarter, refused to go away. Golden State got a huge lift from reserve David Lee, but they rode Curry, who made five three-pointers, his last with 18.9 seconds, to pull the Warriors with 94-91. Game 4 is scheduled on Thursday night. Making the 13th start of his big league career, Heston threw the third strikes pass pinch hitter Danny Muno Curtis Granderson and Ruben Tejeda completing a 5-0 victory over the New York Mets on Tuesday night and the Major League's first no-hitter since Washington's Jordan Zimmerman on the final day of the 2014 regular season. He walked calmly off the mound towards home plate and was hugged by catcher Buster Posey. Heston, who 6-4, struck out 11, 6 looking and allowed just two balls into the outfield. Heston threw 72 of 110 pitches for strikes in the 35th complete game no-hitter by a rookie in Major League history. That's the news for today. We appreciate you joining us. I'm Pete Schiffman. I'm Megan Berger. Our next newscast is Friday at noon again. Uh, you can find a repeat of this show on our archives on LakeCoMagazine.com. Just check for 2015 archives. Thank you for joining us, and you have a great day.